when you spread all the parts out, there seems to be a lot more to this dual hydraulic brake system than I thought. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're impressed, Jim. But don't let all the props I've collected for this brake lesson throw you. The basic hydraulics are the same as for past models. Tom's right, Jim. There's nothing complicated about this new system. However, the parts are different, and there are more pieces than in previous systems. That's because there were a couple of additional things that had to be taken into consideration in designing the dual hydraulic system. For instance, the primary objective was to design separate hydraulic systems for the front and rear brakes. The design had to ensure that loss of pressure in one system wouldn't result in loss of pressure in the other system. The dual hydraulic system had to provide a signal device that would warn the driver of pressure loss in either the front or rear brakes. This was accomplished with a hydraulically operated switch and a warning light. And of course, in normal operation, the new system must provide equal hydraulic pressure in the front and rear brake systems. In other words, the entire system must be hydraulically self-equalizing. One of the great virtues of past as well as the new hydraulic brakes. Suppose you take it from there, Tom. Okay, Tick. It took this completely new tandem master cylinder and this new warning light operating switch to accomplish the design objectives Tech has just told you about. I'll explain how these two units work and why. The master cylinder has two separate brake fluid reservoirs arranged in tandem, one behind the other. However, a single cylinder bore is used. The master cylinder assembly has two separate pistons. The front piston provides pressure to the rear wheel brakes. The rear piston serves the front wheel brakes. This simplified sectional drawing of the basic working parts illustrates a relationship between the front piston and the outlet to the rear brakes. It also shows a relationship between the rear piston and the outlet for the front brakes. I think it's easier to remember which piston does what if you call the rear piston the primary piston because it is actuated directly by the brake pedal or power booster. Besides, the primary piston supplies hydraulic pressure to the front brakes where most of the braking is done. I call the front piston the secondary piston because it's actually a slave piston. That means in normal operation it's hydraulically operated by primary piston pressure. It supplies pressure to the rear brakes. Well, that makes it easy to remember. Primary operates front brakes. Secondary operates rear brakes. Can you explain in easy steps just how the tandem master cylinder works? Sure thing, Jim. But we'll have to add a few parts to our illustration. A piston return spring at the front of the cylinder pushes a secondary piston back against a stop screw. This positions the piston cup so that it's just slightly back of the compensating port. The primary piston assembly also has a return spring. It pushes the primary piston back so that the piston cup uncovers the primary compensating port. The primary piston return spring is slightly stiffer than the secondary return spring, and this has a bearing on master cylinder operation. Suppose you explain it, Tom. Okay, Tick. When the brakes are applied, the stiffer primary piston spring pushes the secondary piston forward, compressing the secondary spring slightly. The secondary piston cup closes off the compensating port, and pressure to the rear brakes starts to increase. At the same time, the primary piston cup has closed off the primary compensating port. Fluid is trapped between the primary piston cup and the cup at the rear of the secondary piston. Further pedal movement produces increased pressure in the primary as well as the secondary chamber. In normal operation, there is a hydraulic link between the primary and secondary pistons. As a result, primary and secondary operating pressures are equal, and front and rear brakes are applied equally and simultaneously. In light brake applications, secondary pressure is slightly higher than primary pressure. That's because the slightly stiffer primary piston spring holds the primary piston back more than the secondary return spring holds its piston back. In other words, spring pressure opposes and reduces hydraulic pressure slightly. 
However, the pressure difference is very minor compared to the total hydraulic pressure developed when the brakes are applied. Just remember, the primary purpose of the secondary and primary return springs is to return the pistons and uncover the compensating ports when the brake pedal is released. You better explain the purpose of those ports, Tom. The compensating ports compensate for expansion and contraction of the brake fluid. If pressure builds up due to heat and expansion of the brake fluid, it is relieved when the pedal is released because fluid flows into the reservoir. As the fluid cools off and contracts, it flows into the cylinder. The main or filler ports serve an entirely different purpose. They permit pumping up the brakes if the pedal is low because of excessive lining clearance. This could happen if the automatic adjusters aren't working. Better explain how those ports work, Tom. When the brake pedal is pumped rapidly, the master cylinder return springs return the master cylinder pistons fast. The brake shoe return springs return the wheel cylinder pistons more slowly. Because of this, the flow of fluid from the wheel cylinders is relatively slow. It can't keep up with the rapid return of the master cylinder piston. As a result, pressure in the master cylinder drops. It becomes lower than the pressure in the reservoir. Atmospheric pressure acting on the fluid in the reservoir pushes fluid through the filler port, through holes in the piston, and past the piston cup. We need those filler ports because the compensating ports are too small to handle the flow needed for pumping up the pedal. It looks to me like you have a question on your mind, Jim. I was going to ask about check valves. It seems to me I remember the older master cylinders had check valves. There's been some changes in check valves, Jim. We call them residual pressure valves now, and they fit into the master cylinder outlets. They're clever little gadgets. Tom will explain how they work. Each valve consists of a seat, a rubber valve, and a spring. When the brakes are released, brake fluid is pushed out of the wheel cylinders and back toward the master cylinder. This unseats the residual pressure valve and allows fluid to flow into the master cylinder. When pressure in the lines drops to about 15 pounds per square inch, the spring seats the valve and maintains this residual pressure. I don't see how that valve can let fluid flow from the master cylinder. It seems to me that master cylinder pressure would only seat it. It does, Jim, but the rubber part of the residual pressure valve is a one-way valve all by itself. Master cylinder pressure opens a passage through the tip of the valve, allowing fluid to flow out and into the brake lines. Why do we need those valves, Tech? If it weren't for the residual pressure valves, air might be sucked past the wheel cylinder cups and into the wheel cylinders every time the brake pedal was released. Incidentally, the residual valves help speed up the pumping up action if the brake pedal is low. That's because they restrict fluid flow from the wheel cylinder lines when the pedal is released. This speeds up refilling of the system from the reservoir. When you service a master cylinder for a car or truck with drum-type brakes, be sure there is a residual valve in both outlets. When you service a master cylinder for a disc brake job, make sure there is only one residual valve. That one valve must be in the secondary outlet at the front of the master cylinder. That's the one for the rear brakes, remember? Uh, I remember all right, but I still have a question. Why don't they use a residual valve in the outlet to the disc brakes? I reckon that's a logical question, Jim. Disc brakes use pistons and seals instead of wheel cylinder cups with a sealing lip. The disc brake piston seals work something like an O-ring, so there's no danger of sucking in air. Besides, since disc brakes don't have shoe return springs, residual pressure would cause brake drag. Well, that gives me a good idea of normal master cylinder operation. Now, suppose you explain what happens if pressure is lost in one system. Okay, Jim. I'll cover pressure loss in the front brakes first. If there is very little hydraulic pressure resisting primary piston movement, the primary piston moves forward until it bottoms out against the secondary piston. The secondary piston is then actuated mechanically instead of hydraulically, so the rear wheel brakes work normally. On the other hand, if pressure is lost in the rear brakes, the secondary piston bottoms against the end of the master cylinder.
The primary piston supplies pressure for normal front brake operation. That answers my question. Next, I'm curious about the brake warning light. You'll have to control your curiosity until someone turns the record, Jim. The warning light story is on the other side. This special brake line, T and switch, operates a warning light that tells the driver if pressure is lost in either the front or rear brakes. This new unit isn't a simple T fitting, like it was on past models, but it seems to have inherited that name. The front brake system line from the master cylinder and the lines leading to the front wheel cylinders are at one end of the fitting. The rear brake master cylinder line and rear wheel cylinder line are at the other end. Suppose you explain what's inside the T, Tom. Okay, Tech. A barbell-shaped piston with an O-ring on each end separates the front and rear hydraulic systems. Two small coil springs keep the piston centered as long as pressure is the same in both systems. If pressure is lost in one system, pressure in the other system pushes the piston off-center. The piston completes a circuit to ground when it touches the insulated electrical contact of the switch. The brake warning light switch completes a circuit that lights the brake system warning light. This same light also serves as a parking brake warning light. Now that Jim knows how the dual brake system works, let's give him a closer look at some of the hardware and cover some of the service tips and precautions. Sounds like a good plan, Tig. This is the type of master cylinder used with drum brakes. It has relatively shallow reservoirs. The cover is held in place by a screw and clamp. I see that there are residual valves in both outlets. I also notice that the secondary outlet is marked R because it serves the rear brakes. And the primary outlet is marked F for front brakes. <laughs> I'm glad you have that primary and secondary bit straight. Now, notice that the master cylinder reservoirs are sealed by a rubber cover gasket with integral diaphragms. The diaphragms are very flexible so they can rise or fall as fluid level in the reservoirs goes up or down. That new cover gasket is a good feature because it keeps out all dirt and moisture. This is important because brake fluid readily absorbs water and moisture in the brake fluid is very undesirable. Here's another important little feature. The space between the cover and the diaphragm must be vented so that the diaphragm can work easily. Otherwise, the heat generated by severe stopping conditions could cause fluid expansion, pressure buildup, and dragging brakes. To avoid this possibility, small vent grooves are formed in the master cylinder cover. These grooves vent the space between the diaphragm gasket and the cover. I probably wouldn't have even noticed those vent grooves if you hadn't pointed them out. What's next on the program? I think it's high time we covered some of the important service highlights. The first time you work on one of these new jobs, you'll notice that the front and rear brake line tube nuts are not the same size. This was done on purpose, so there'd be no chance of connecting the lines to the wrong master cylinder outlets. On non-power brake jobs, the pedal push rod is retained in the primary piston of the master cylinder. So disconnect the rod from the brake pedal and remove it with the master cylinder. To disassemble the cylinder, remove the piston and boot retainer screws. This lets you remove the piston and push rod as an assembly. If you're going to replace the primary piston assembly, you'll have to separate the push rod from the piston. I use an open vise to hold the piston and a heavy screwdriver to force the push rod. How's that rod held in the piston? The outside diameter of this rubber retainer locks into an undercut groove in the master cylinder piston. The inside diameter of the retainer seats in a groove in the end of the push rod. When you reassemble a push rod in a master cylinder, you must use a new retainer. Install a retainer on the rod and then push it into the primary piston. A little brake fluid on the retainer will make the job a lot easier. How about the secondary piston? On this master cylinder, the secondary piston is retained by this set screw in the side of the master cylinder. Remove it and tap the master cylinder on a soft top bench to remove the secondary piston. If the secondary piston doesn't come out, use air to blow it out. But let me warn you, the air pressure will push the piston cup lips out, so they'll be cut by the edges of the filler ports. As a result, they must be replaced. As a matter of fact, any time you overhaul a master cylinder, 
use all of the new rubber parts in the repair kit. It's mighty risky to use some of the old parts, even if they do look all right. That's for sure, Tech. To disassemble this master cylinder used with drum-type power brakes, loosen the piston retainer screw, push in on the piston, and then flip the piston retainer out of the way. This lets you remove the piston. On this master cylinder used with power disc brakes, a piston set screw retains both the primary and secondary pistons. I know there's no residual valve in the primary outlet, but what about residual valve service? You should service the residual pressure valves whenever you rebuild a master cylinder. Disc brake or drum brake type. Use an easy out type puller to remove the tube seats. Discard the tube seats and the rubber valves. Install new valves and tube seats after you have cleaned and rebuilt the rest of the master cylinder. Speaking of rebuilding, be sure all parts are clean. Then lubricate them liberally with brake fluid before assembly so they'll slip past the ports without being damaged. Be especially careful when working the lips of the piston cups into the cylinder bore, or you'll damage the cup and have a leaker. I've found that because of the extra parts, it's more difficult to bleed air bubbles out of the dual brake system. So it's important to avoid getting air into the system, and equally important to bleed brakes correctly to remove all trapped air. Always bleed the master cylinder before connecting the brake lines. To do this, connect bleeder tubes to the outlet ports. Make sure the other ends of the tubes are covered by the fluid in the reservoirs. Pump the primary piston full stroke until no more bubbles come out of the bleeder tubes. This may take 20 or 30 strokes, so don't stop pumping until all of the air is bled from the master cylinder. Since there is no residual valve in the primary outlet of a disc brake master cylinder, plug the primary outlet after bleeding. Leave the plug in place until you're ready to connect the front brake line. When bleeding air out of the brake lines, the bleed screws must be fully open. If you crack a bleed screw less than one full turn, an orifice is formed and the trapped air tends to compress and form into tiny bubbles which are extremely difficult to remove. If the bleeder screws are not opened fully, the brake pedal may feel firm even though all of the air hasn't been bled out of the system. As a result, the pedal may go almost to the floor after the car has been parked for several hours. After one or two brake applications, the pedal may again feel firm until the car has been parked for several hours again. In other words, air in a dual hydraulic brake system doesn't necessarily produce a spongy pedal so you can't depend on pedal feel to detect air. The best solution to this puzzling problem is to bleed the master cylinder and then the lines completely and correctly. I've found that the easiest way to bleed disc brakes is to open the bleed screw and let fluid drain without applying any pressure to the master cylinder. Of course, this won't work on drum brakes because of the residual valves. On all dual hydraulic brake systems, be especially careful to keep the fluid level in the reservoir up when bleeding. If the level gets low, you'll pump air into the system and make a lot of extra work for yourself. If you ever get a job with a dry or almost dry reservoir, disconnect the lines and bleed the master cylinder before you attempt to bleed the rest of the system. This is easily done on the car without removing the master cylinder. That's a good tip. And here's another. On past models with a single master cylinder, you check the compensating port by looking into the reservoir to see if fluid squirted out of the port when brakes were applied lightly. On tandem master cylinder jobs, the primary piston moves past the port before there's enough pressure to produce this typical squirt of fluid. To check a tandem master cylinder, have someone pump the brakes rapidly several times, and then hold the pedal down to trap pressure in the master cylinder. Then watch closely while the pedal is released very slowly. If the compensating ports are open, you'll see a squirt or swirl of fluid as the ports are uncovered. If you don't see fluid swirling out of the ports, repeat the test several times to make sure the ports aren't compensating. On power brake jobs, the trouble could be in the push rod adjustment. If the rod is too long, it won't let the pistons return far enough to uncover the compensating ports. Gee, I didn't realize how much there was to learn about dual master cylinder brakes. Like you said, Tech, 
They aren't complicated, but all the extra parts do give you a lot of new things to think about when you service them. They sure do, Jim. And now, I hope this session gave all of you master technicians out there a better understanding of the dual master cylinder brake system and a few things to think about. Be sure and read the 1967 service manuals and reference book for this session. The additional service information in them will come in handy. I'll see you all next month when we kick off our 20th year of getting together monthly to bone up on current service subjects. Thank you.